So for this part, we're going to look at uh, another problem then, which is to locate routes, so zero crossing points. So um, again, this is a, a, it's a rather similar problem to minimum finding, except the only difference is that rather than trying to find the smallest value of f of x, you're trying to find where f of x is equal to zero. And again, SciPy optimizes several different algorithms for route finding uh, in functions. But again, the most straightforward is the f solve function, and it works in a very, very similar way to f min, um, except it's trying to solve it for x equals zero. Sorry, f of x is equal to zero. So again, let's just go back to our very simple quadratic function. Um, and again, we know that the roots of this function are one and three, because it does actually have an analytical solution that we can, we can sort out. Um, okay, so we use f solve like we used f min. We have to give it a starting point to locate the root. So we just import f solve from scipy optimize. And then again, I've just told it, find me the root that's near zero. And again, like f solve, I can give it arguments um, that are the a, b, and c parameters. And what it returns is an array, in this case of one value, telling me there is a root at x equals one, which is good because that's what we were expecting. Um, unlike f min, um, we can give f solve a number of different starting um, estimates, so starting locations. Um, and so we can maybe go and use that to locate where there are multiple routes. Um, so in this case here, I'm going to say um, do f solve for the same quadratic function. And note, just like f min, we're passing it just the name of the function, not a call to the function, not a string of the name of the function, but the actual function identifier. Um, and then I'm going to pass it the starting values zero and four. So I'm going to say, I think there's a root at zero and I think there's another one around four. And again, the same arguments. And it comes back and it now tells me it's found roots at one and three. So that's good. We've located both the roots of the function. So um, to get all those roots um, within a certain range, then there are a number of different strategies we could do. So there I just said, well, I can't a quadratic function. I know there are two roots. So let's just start at close to the extremes of my range and, and it should find both of them. Um, so um, if you don't quite got as much information about how that function is going to work, and you don't necessarily know, then uh, one thing you could do, for example, would be to try and use fsolve to look for roots along a whole lots of different um, starting values. Um, that'll then give you an array of roots, um, but unfortunately it'll also probably have quite a lot of repeated values. So if again with that quadratic function, if I was looking for those two roots and I gave it 10 starting values, it would come back with 10 different roots. And then because they, in general, you can't compare two floating point numbers, you'd have to decide um, whether or not those those roots were genuinely unique. Um, well, we could use NP unique to reduce that. But we have to do a bit of rounding as well to go and make that work. Um, so here's a bit of code that goes and does that. <coughs> so whilst we're working our way through these nested functions, I'm calling NP unique. That's going to make sure I only have um, one value. But each value is going to only appear once in my array. And then I'm going to do that with a set of things I've rounded. So that's the mp.round. Uh, I'm rounding things to five decimal places. And then inside that, I go and do the f solve. Um, and I'm using here my modified Landau function because it's not quite as straightforward as the quadratic. Um, and I'm going to give it 21 different starting points to go and find its roots. Um, and then I'm just passing it in the other arguments it needs to work. And then the plot below, what you can see is lots and lots and lots of red lines that's evaluated those functions. Um, it's found roots 21 times. And I rounded those to five decimal places. And then I um, found the unique values. And it's come back and told me four different routes it's found. Um, so there are four points at which that, that function crosses zero. Um, 
And if one looks at the function, then yes, you'd see that. That indeed is going to be the case. The reason there are two at around about zero is the fact you've got this linear term. So you have one root at precisely x equals zero. And then after that, the function cone goes up a little bit due to the, um, the linear term of that lot function. And then eventually the quadratic term wins out and it goes negative. And then eventually the quartic term wins out and it turns positive again. Um, so that's why you get um, those that number of roots. So that, of course, is is got this advantage. It's quite slow. It's quite messy. Um, so really, we're better. We could find a slightly smarter way of trying to find where those roots are. Um, and this, again, is actually where it gets into the bit of challenge of using um, uh, the SciPy modules is that because they're not magic, because it relies on you being able to apply a little bit of brain power ahead of times, one of the, the bits where a little bit of brain power is really important is in figuring out how to make smart guesses of starting values. So what I've done here is I've taken my 21 um, starting points I had previously, and I've calculated what the uh, Landau, what my modified Landau function actually could give me. Um, for those potential char values of x. Um, and then what I'm going to do is say, um, let's just look at the points where we cross between um, positive to negative, because that's going to be a point. I know every time I cross between a positive and negative value, I'm going to have a zero crossing point. I'm going to have a root. So the, I first of all, I work out um, where my trial values are greater than zero. So that's going to be plus if it's, that's going to be a true value if the trial value I calculated was positive and false if it's negative. And I use np diff, which is going to look at whether a, an array value changed um, as I walked along the array to look for the points where I go from positive to negative or negative to positive. Then I work out the x-coordinate um, that's exactly halfway between all my trial values and simply use the combination of those two things to work out an approximate idea of where my crossing points were. Um, and so I can print out my trial guesses and it says, oh, well, I think there's something between um, minus 4.5 and um, uh, minus 5. So let's say it's at minus 4.75. Oh, we think there's something at 0.25, something at um, 0.75 and something at 4.25. And I'm going to feed those trial guesses into um, my F solve. So when I go and do that, um, it then runs away again and it comes back and now it's found um, the, the values. Now you'll notice that it's not found exactly zero. It's found minus 3.378 times 10 to the minus 10. That's a good example of how doing numerical calculations and floating point numbers can give you things which are not exactly what you were expecting. Analytically, I could solve this equation and show that x equals zero um, should in fact give you a zero value. Um, but because of numerical rounding errors when the computer's working doing the sums, you get these smaller uncertainties and small errors. Um, and and that's, that's to be expected. So why is this better? Well, what you can see is that we have got much less red dots and red lines than on the previous example. And that's telling you we've had to do a lot less work calculating the function. So previously, we gave f solve 21 different starting points. And then in order to go and solve those roots, it had to maybe evaluate the function for each of those 21 starting points itself. It had to evaluate another 50 or 60 times. And so the total number of function evaluations was something like 50 times 21, which is already like a thousand um, of function evaluations. Whereas instead, what I've now done, by doing my little bit of smart guesswork ahead of time, I had to evaluate my function 20 times there. Um, that then gave me four starting points. And then I had maybe to evaluate those four starting points, say 50 times each. And so I had four times 50 plus my 21, gives me 221 starting points. So I've done five times less work evaluating my function by being a little bit smarter in how my guesses work. And so that's why it's really worthwhile when you're using these sort of numerical methods to spend your time being smart about your guesses.